All right, so if you have your Bible, turn with me to John chapter 3. We're going to be covering uh, verses 1 through 12 this morning. We're, we're working our way through, as you've, you've been around, you, you know this, through John's gospel. And we've covered the first couple of chapters. Uh, Pastor Brandon did a great job last week of wrapping up uh, John chapter 2. And this morning, we get this opportunity to eavesdrop, so to speak, on this incredible conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. And in this conversation, we're going to be introduced to one of the most important doctrines of the Christian faith, and that is the doctrine of the new birth, or what we call in in theological language, regeneration. And because this is Jesus' most direct teaching on the new birth, now we'll see it taught about by other gospel or other writers in the scriptures in other places, but this is really the most direct teaching that we have from Jesus on the new birth. I want to approach it from the standpoint of of really trying to answer the questions that Jesus answers. So here's what we'll try to answer this morning from the text. What is the new birth? What are we talking about when we talk about this, this, this doctrine? What are the results? What are the results of the new birth? What happens to those, again, who are, who are born again? And then how is it experienced? So how is the new birth experienced? Now, again, I said we're going to cover verses 1 through 12 of John chapter 3, but in order for us to make sense of that, we have to look at the, the, two, the three verses that precede that passage. So look with me at John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. Now, when he, that is Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and he needed no one to bear witness about man for he knew, he himself knew what was in man. John tells us in that section that that many apparently wanted to believe in Jesus. They, They believed him, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them. Why? Because the text tells us he knew what was in man. What did Jesus know was in man? Well, It was the sin problem, the disease of sin. In fact, Jesus will explain it further when we get to a little bit later on in this chapter when he says that by nature people love darkness rather than light. By nature nature people stand condemned by God, separated from Him and under His wrath even when they enter the world. The new birth that we're going to get to in a moment is necessary because of man's sin problem, the disease of sin. There was a, in the mid-90s, there was a man in Southern California who uh, became pretty radical for a decision that he made. He was a pastor who um, was well-known. He was part of this mega church called Irvine, or, or uh, Mariner's Church in Irvine. His name was Spencer Burke, and he was a pastor at this big church, one of the associates, until to the shock of everyone at the church, he abruptly resigned with no other job, uh, no other prospects, nothing sort of in the pipeline. And he moved into a 700-square-foot, what he called a shack, across from uh, the beach. And when questioned about his decision, this guy, in in his abrupt resignation, Burke said that he was tired of the business of doing church, what he called feeding the machine, making sure that every week the the temperature was right and the lights were right and the production was sound and everything went uh, flawlessly. In an article he wrote in 2003, a little bit after, as he was reflecting on his uh, resignation, he said, helping well-dressed families in SUVs find the next available parking spot isn't my spiritual gift. He said he, he kind of got tired of what, what he called the machine, making sure that everything was always running properly. And he said, beyond that, what, what really started to trouble him was something he noticed in the Christian world, which he would address later in a, in a moment of maybe greater candor, he said that what he noticed was within much of contemporary Christianity, there was very little confession of sin. There was very little humility and brokenness, very little transparency. But instead, there was what he called a preference for activism. I don't agree with everything that Burke says. In fact, there's much that he writes that I don't agree with. Um, But He does make some thought-provoking points, especially when he says that many Christians are so eager to combat the evils of the world, 
you know, sex trafficking and, and um, the abusing of people and, and poverty and homelessness and all these things. He said, many Christians are very eager to combat the evils of the world, but very few want to deal with their own idols and their own sin tendencies, preferring instead to see sin as something out there rather than something in here. And I realize when we talk about sin, I'm talking about a concept that, first of all, is not very popular, but it's also very misunderstood. A lot of times when we look at sin, we consider it simply as outward rebellion against God's commands. And certainly it is that. Bad actions, we look at immoral behavior kind of as the the, the quintessential example of sin. But we sin against the Holy God not just when we do bad things, although again, that is a sin, but when we love other things more than we love God, when we delight in other things more than we delight in God, when we seek our own glory rather than the glory of God. We sin not just in our actions, but in our motives, in our affections, in our interests, in our desires. Uh, One author and counselor, David Powlison, who's written extensively on this subject, he explains it this way. Once we see sin for what it really is, madness and evil intentions in our hearts, absence of any fear of God, slavery to various passions, then it becomes easier to see how sin is the immediate and specific problem we all deal with at every moment, not a general and remote problem. So I say all that because when we get into John chapter 3, which we're going to do here in about 30 seconds, it's important that we understand what it is that necessitates the new birth, and that is the disease of sin that we all struggle with. And now, unless we believe that sin is simply a behavior, something bad we do, Jesus' first gospel presentation, so to speak, is addressed to a religious person, and not just a religious person, but the most religious person in a very religious society. So let me read just the entire section, the 12 verses, verses then we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, the word of the Lord reads like this. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen but you do not receive our testimony. If I told you earthly, earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So John tells us that Jesus is approached by Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, we're told, and the, Pharisee, uh, the Pharisees were a group of religious leaders who really prided themselves in not just keeping the law very strictly, which they did, but also keeping all of their own interpretations and applications of the law. Uh, Nicodemus was a member of the Jewish ruling council, which means he was part of the Sanhedrin, which was kind of a, a Jewish supreme court. So not only was this person very religious, he was a man who, who wielded great influence and power, and yet that power and prestige had not translated into happiness. All it brought with it was questions. So Nicodemus came to Jesus, we're told, at night. The fact that he came to Jesus at night is important. It's an important distinction. He came to Jesus at night for the reason that anyone does anything at night because he didn't want to be seen by anyone else. Now, this goes all the way back to the Old Testament, this idea of people doing things at night in order to not be seen. Uh, Gideon, the great warrior of the Old Testament, was instructed by God to tear down all the bales of his, and the idols of his father and the Asherah poles, 
and instead told to, to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. And we're told in Judges 6, So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. So, so people who don't want to be seen, they don't want their actions to be observed by anyone else, they do things by, by night. And so Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night because he's ashamed. He, he, and this is, of course, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, this is, this is what religion apart from Christ does from everyone. It leads to guilt and shame and defensiveness. But he doesn't want anyone to, be, to see him because what would people think if Nicodemus, this great Pharisee, this great teacher of the law, was seen asking questions and listening to this carpenter turned rabbi? He knew the shame that it might bring. And so he says to him at night, he comes to him at night into the shadows of darkness, and he says, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher from God because no one can do the things you do unless God is with them. And Jesus answers kind of oddly, not really addressing the question, but he says this in verse 3. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know how you get someone's attention. If, if you're going to say something that you know that they really need to hear, you might say, you might sort of raise your voice and say, look at me. Look at me. You need to hear what I'm going to say. Maybe you, I, I know some guys can do, I want to be careful not to flip you off when I do this. Some guys can do two, two fingers in their mouth and they make this loud whistle, right? So everybody stops. It gets their attention. They know that it's time to turn and listen. I don't know how you get maybe your kids' attention, what you say, what you do, when you want to emphasize that, that, that something is of great urgency. But when Jesus wanted to make a point and wanted it to be known, this is something you need to listen to, he began by saying this, truly, truly, I say to you, amen and amen, I say to you. In other words, what I'm going to say to you is critical. And I'm asking you, I'm pleading with you to listen. So the idea that this phrase appears three times in this short conversation with Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus says, it suggests that this is really important stuff. So in order, in order to correct Nicodemus's confusion, Jesus makes some comments about the new birth. Nicodemus doesn't understand it. He doesn't know how does this work? How can these things be? And Jesus says that anyone who's going to see the kingdom must be born of water and the Spirit. Now, being born of water is not a reference to baptism, as some have interpreted it, but it is, in my estimation, simply a reference to being born physically. In fact, uh, now, now there are about seven different interpretations of this, and I don't, I don't claim to have the authoritative one by any stretch, but... I do think that the fact that Jesus says that which is born of the flesh is flesh indicates he's talking about being born of water as a physical birth. If you've ever been around a woman who's about ready to give birth and you could go at any minute, you, 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 you might hear someone say, well, her water just broke, right? That means it's, this could happen at any second. Well, what, this is what Jesus is talking about here. Being born of water is physical birth. So he says anyone who would the, see the kingdom of God has to be born physically, obviously, but not just physically. You have to be born of water and of spirit. These are different things. To be born of the spirit means to be born again from above. In fact, that phrase that we translate born again uh, could also maybe even better be rendered born from above. To be born again means to, given, to be given spiritual life from above by the spirit of God. So here's, here's the answer to the first question. What is the new birth? The new birth is the gracious and miraculous work of God by which He gives spiritual life to those who are spiritually dead. This is a, this is a monergistic act, okay? Mono means one, gistic, the work of. It's the work of one. Synergistic, you know, people say, well, that was, we, we put our heads together, it was a synergistic effort. Syn, syn just means with, the work, with, working together. This is the work of one. Only God can make someone alive. Only God can give life. Notice Jesus doesn't command anyone to be born again. It's not something a person can do. Only God can do it. This is not a new religion we're talking about. 
Nicodemus didn't new, need a new religion. He didn't need other things he could do to become right with God. He was religious enough as it was. This was not a performance improvement plan, right? If you do these things, you can kind of become better. Before. No, this is, uh, Nicodemus didn't need a new religion. He needed a new life, a supernatural act of God. And that's what God brings. He takes someone who is spiritually dead, physically alive, yes, but spiritually dead, and he brings them to life in an instant, giving them an ability to recognize God's holiness in a way that's actually person, personally significant, bringing them to a place of a recognition of their own sin, enabling them to have faith in Jesus Christ. It's all part of the new birth, the regeneration. There are a lot of descriptors, you know, that we use to, to distinguish people and people groups from, from one another. For example, maybe the, the, the clearest distinction, if you're trying to, to separate or, or identify one person over another, is male and female, right? Although that, of course, has been, is being blurred now as we talk about it. But that's, that's you know, male and female. We might, we might try to make a distinguish, a distinguish two people saying black and white. It was a, it was a black man or, or a white man or a black lady or a white lady. Um, we might say, in other words, to make a distinction, we might say, rich and poor, or, or an American citizen and an international. We, we might say educated and, and uneducated. You know, again, making the distinction. We might, around here, we might say an Alabama fan, right, or an Auburn fan. There's a very clear uh, line there between those two groups, right? Um, we, might say, we might say people with a full head of hair are those who are truly beautiful. We might make that distinction. You can... You, there are a number of things you can do, right, to, to, set, to make distinction. But when God looks down on the earth, he looks down at his people, he only sees two types of people. And it's not black and white. It's not male and female, right? It's not fans of a certain team or fans of another team. He only sees two people, those who are spiritually dead and those who are spiritually alive. Those who have had their sins covered by Jesus Christ and his cross work by faith. They've been united to Christ. They've been made alive in Christ. And those who are dead in sin. Those who still stand under the wrath of God. So what God does is he makes people alive in Christ. Transforming those who are spiritually dead to those who are spiritually alive. All right. So our second question, what are the results of the new birth? What does it result in? Well, again, if you read... You read the Pauline letters, you, you see Paul talks a lot about the new birth and, and what it results in, but I want to focus just on what we see in this passage. So what does Jesus say the results might, are, are of the new birth? Well, Jesus says, without the new birth, except a man, be, one be born again, one cannot see the kingdom of God. So what does that necessarily imply there? Well, that through the new birth, a person can see the kingdom of God. So I'm going to give you just a few results in the new birth from this passage. The first one is a new hope, eternity with God. Those who have been born from above have a new hope. For those who are outside of Christ, there is no hope for eternity, only the promise of eternal judgment. All those who have not believed in Jesus Christ stand condemned before God. In fact, Jesus will say this very thing later on in the same chapter. John 3, verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So a person who is, is dead in sin has never repented of his or her sin, never run to Jesus Christ in faith, trust in the cross work of Jesus, that person has no hope for eternity, only the promise of judgment. But the one who's been made alive in Christ through faith in Jesus Christ, they gain entrance into the kingdom of God and thereby see it. When he says, he says a person is able to know he can see the kingdom of God, he's talking about entering the kingdom of God. That person, though, will spend eternity with God in a new kingdom where Jesus reigns forever. Now, we'll talk a lot more about that in the upcoming weeks, but I believe that when, when Jesus talks about seeing the kingdom, seeing the kingdom has a double meaning. Certainly, seeing the kingdom means entering the kingdom, but it goes beyond that. A person who's spiritually dead is only aware of one thing, really, what affects him or her, and maybe their immediate family. 
But one result of the new birth is the ability to see, see the kingdom of God advancing. A person who's been born from above gains spiritual eyes, and he or she then can see God's work in the world. Here's another result of the, the new birth. It is a new vision. And here's what I mean by that. For those who have been reborn, no longer are we consumed with our own personal interests. But, but in Christ, we're able to see the bigger picture. It's kind of like the lid is taken off of the box. And where we only used to see the world in black and white, now we see it in full color. We actually can see the work that God is doing around the world. We see how God is bringing people from every tribe, tongue, and nation to saving faith in Him. We see how people is take, God is taking people from pagan religions, from hopeless scenarios, from a place with no hope for the future, and He's, he's bringing them to repentance and faith. It's only understood, though. It's only seen by those with spiritual eyes. And this is what Jesus alludes to in verse 12 when He chastises Nicodemus for his lack of understanding. He says, If I tell you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? In other words, God is in the business of reconciling a broken world to himself through Jesus Christ. But only those with spiritual eyes can see this. Every day, God is turning chaos into beauty. By His grace and through the gospel, He's restoring broken relationships. He's healing, hurting marriages. He's snatching people up from the enslavement to addiction. He's bringing people to to repentance and humble faith, giving them the power to obey Him, giving them the ability to worship Him. But only the person with spiritual eyes can see that. The person who's not been born from above cannot see God's work in the kingdom. And the person who has spiritual eyes wants to be a part of it by sharing the good news of God's reconciling work. Now here's another, the final result of the new birth as we dig deep in this passage. The the new birth results in new affections. When God makes us alive in Christ, He gives us a new heart. And what does a new heart have? It's new desires. In fact, this is the analogy for the new birth that we see going all the way back to the Old Testament. The prophet Ezekiel, he talks about the new birth as getting a new, a new heart. Ezekiel 36, verses 24 and 25, From all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. When God makes us alive in Christ. We are, we're born again from above. The most important thing that changes is what we love. So we, we can fool people by how we act, can't we? we? We can live a certain way and fool people, but what we love really tells people what we're all about. What is it that you love this morning the most? What is it that you think about What is it that you find yourself daydreaming about? What is it that scares you to death at the thought of losing it? What we love tells, shows what we're really all about. And when God makes us alive in Christ, He gives us new affections. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, who was, I think, by all accounts, the greatest preacher and theologian ever born in America, Uh, In the mid-1700s, God used Jonathan Edwards to bring thousands of people to to saving faith through what was known as the Second Great Awakening. Well, when Edwards preached, what happened was these people who were known in in the community as the worst people in the town, the the drunks and the rabble-rousers and the adulterers and the the people, the thieves and all, they were coming to faith in Christ. And so people were saying, well, this this can't be real. I, I knew this person. I've been around this person his whole life. There's no way that this is actually real. So Jonathan Edwards, he wrote a book called The Religious Affections. And he said that the beauty and the power of the new birth is most evident in the changed affections of the people that God saves. He wrote this, Inasmuch as by regeneration, this is again another phrase for the new birth, persons are renewed in the whole man Holy affections are a very great part of it. 
One's inclinations and heart are exercised toward God and divine things with such strength and vigor that these holy exercises do prevail in him above carnal or natural affections. In other words, the greatest evidence that a person has been born from above, that a person has been made alive in Christ, is the radical change in what that person loves. What that person loves the most, we can say. Again, nothing reveals more about us than what we love. And for those who are in Christ, what they love most is what God loves most. Grace and mercy, forgiveness, redemption, God's own glory. You'll see people who are, for, who are born from above delighting in the worship of God. They love to worship God because they know that God is worthy of all worship. Now, of course, different personality types, it, that delight manifests itself in different ways, but people who are born from above, they delight in the worship of God because God loves to be worshiped. You'll see people who are born from above, who've been made alive in Christ, they, they, because they know that the grace that they've been shown, they love to see grace. They love to show grace. I read a story not long ago in the USA Today about, uh, about Stephen and Mackenzie Schultz, a couple in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, who, Iowa, who went out to dinner to celebrate their sixth anniversary. Um, but it was anything but a relaxing evening. They went out to dinner on their sixth anniversary, and they had to wait an hour to get seated. Sounds like what I went through last night. And uh, they, then, they, then they had to wait another 30 minutes for the, the waiter to come around and, and take their order. And then finally they ordered, and their food came, and the food was cold, been sitting in the back for who knows how long. And uh, the, the, the waiter, the server was nowhere to be found. And so they, they just kind of sat there with, with their cold food. They couldn't get anyone uh, to, to help them, and it was just a, a miserable experience. But as they looked around, and the other patrons were kind of shaking their heads in disgust, Stephen and Mackenzie took a different approach. They gave their server a 150% tip, not 15%, 150%. On a $66 bill, they tipped $100. Now, why? Very simply, they had been extended such kindness and patience and grace when they used to wait tables during their pre-marriage days. And, and next to the signature on the bill, Mackenzie wrote, we've both been in your shoes. People who have been born from above, they love grace because they understand how much grace they've received. Now, it doesn't mean in order to be a good Christian, you have to tip 150%. But what it does mean is there has to be a recognition of, a delight in, a love for grace, not just to see it, but to demonstrate it. It means that those who've been born from above, when they see people struggling with sin and making horrible decisions and blowing it time after time and making a wreck of their lives, they say, look, we've been in your shoes. In fact, we're wearing the same shoes. You'll see people who've been born from above confessing their sin to one another because they know that God loves reconciliation, and so they love reconciliation. You'll see people who've been born from above sharing the good news with others because they love to see God and see other people experiencing the forgiveness that they have experienced. And so again, it's that, that those new affections that are part of the new heart. Now, let's get to the final question. How is the new birth experienced? Look at verses 7 and 8 again. Jesus says, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, there's a fascinating play on word. The Hebrew word ruach is actually the word that can be translated spirit or wind. And what Jesus does here is he equates the work of the Spirit with the wind. The wind cannot be tamed. If you've ever Googled any videos of a horrible hurricane or horrible tornado, or, or maybe many of you, I think some of you, many of you lived in North Alabama when there were horrible tornadoes that came through and, and just brought all kinds of destruction, you, you, you've seen the power of the wind. 
you know that the wind blows. For, no one can control the wind. You can't wrap your arms around the wind and make it go a certain place. You can't make the wind go in a certain direction. No one can control the wind. No one can harness the wind. And this is the way the Spirit works. God saves whom He wants to save, when He wants to save them, and how He wants to save them. And that can't be manipulated. You, you can have a worship service. Thankfully, Pastor Chris would never do this, but you can have a worship service where you sing just as I am for an hour. A hundred verses. I don't know how many verses there are. You sing that verse, you sing it over and over and over again. And you can have a pastor up there just pleading over and over. No one's going to leave until someone comes forward. And you, you can beg. I could, I could be up here begging people. We could probably get some people to come forward. But no one will be born from above because of that. You can't manipulate the work of the Spirit. You can't control the work of the Spirit. It's like the wind. It goes where it pleases. It works and it displays its power where it pleases. And this is the way the Spirit works. When the Spirit gives life to those who are dead, the Spirit can't be controlled. The Spirit can't be cajoled. The Spirit can't be manipulated. Now, there are some things that are common to those who have been acted upon by the Spirit, and there's some things that are very different in terms of experience. If you've heard or read the stories of men and women of, of the faith, you, you know that people have very different testimonies of, what, of their conversion, conversion experiences being made alive. Sometimes they're overwhelmed with unbelievable emotion, sometimes on their knees weeping. At, that, at the, uh, the second great awakening I mentioned just a minute ago, there are people who were digging their fingernails in the wooden pews. They were on their faces before God. Now, but, but it's a different experience for different people. For example, Augustine, the, the great 4th century bishop, who's perhaps the most influential theologian ever to live outside of the Bible, he had a very emotional conversion. Here's a man who was caught up in sexual sin for three decades, or at least until he was in his 30s, a prisoner to sexual lust and sin, constantly seeking meaning and pleasure and sexual gratification, but it wasn't working. He was miserable. He was despondent. When he was 31 years old, he was so depressed and so empty that he got away, retreated to a, a, a garden next to a friend's house where, where no one knew where he was, and he became so overwhelmed with grief and guilt. He said, I was beside myself with madness I was frantic, overcome by violent anger with myself. I tore my hair and hammered my forehead with fists. You've got to be pretty worked up to do that, which I'm not advising, by the way. And then he said, I fell to my knees. He went back inside the house. He opened the Bible, started reading the book of Romans, came to this passage in Romans which says, Spend no more thought on nature's appetite he said, at that moment, in an instant, the light of Christ flooded my soul. I was broken and undone. God brought Augustine, this great theologian, to repentance and faith. Martin Luther, you probably heard about his, he had experienced a similar radical conversion. He was a monk. He was a Bible teacher. He was a lecturer in the Scriptures. And he came across this phrase in the book of Romans, the righteousness of God is by faith. And he realized that he hated God. He was lecturing about God. He was teaching on God. He was lecturing from the Psalter. But he realized he hated God. And the thought of God's righteousness led him to fear and anger and loathing. And he said, at that moment, I was undone. Of course, the Apostle Paul, we read about his testimony of being blinded by a light on the road to Damascus. Sometimes when people are born from above, it is accompanied by incredible emotion. But sometimes... It's not. Sometimes it actually seems rather mundane. C.S. Lewis, uh, as he reflected on his own conversion, he said, I don't, I don't know how it happened. I, I can't really explain it. It was not the least bit emotional. It was more like when a man, after lying motionless, becomes aware that he is now awake. There was no, he didn't punch himself in the face like Augustine did. He just became aware of like, you know what, I was dead. And now I'm alive. 
whether it's emotional or unemotional, is irrelevant. What matters is, for the first time, there's an awareness of our sinfulness and God's holiness and a belief in Jesus Christ as the only way to remedy this devastating separation that we suffer from a holy God. And there's, there, there becomes then a real desire to glorify Him and a real love for the things that God loves and a real interest in worshiping Him and a sense of relief and a sense of joy and a sense of laughter at the forgiveness that we've received and a desire to do His will. Here's the answer to the final question. How is the new birth experienced? Through faith, we are united with Jesus Christ, indwelled by the Holy Spirit, and sealed for all eternity. That's the experience. Again, it's different for different people. Sometimes it's emotional. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a person flat out on their face before God. Sometimes it's more reflective. The question is not, have you ever had an amazing encounter with God? The question is not, have you ever felt the overwhelming presence of God? The question is, in what are you trusting this morning? That's the question. In what are you trusting? Are you trusting in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for your sin as your only hope for salvation? Or are you trusting in your own goodness, in your own ability? If it's the former, trusting in Christ and His work, you can have hope for eternity that cannot be shaken. You belong to God, and He is your God, your treasure, your King. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ. If you're trusting in the latter, your goodness, your ability, it means you're still dead in sin. You're still under the wrath of God this morning. But this morning, you can experience the new birth. You can be born from above by believing on Jesus Christ. You can experience new life in Christ, fellowship with God, the forgiveness of sins, even this morning, by turning from your sins and trusting in Jesus Christ. And maybe... For some of you this morning, God is reassuring you of His love for you in Christ. You know, it was not emotional, it was not gut-wrenching, you didn't weep, but you know there was a moment when you came to the realization that you needed to be saved. You were a sinner, broken and undone before a holy God, and you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And maybe this morning God wants to reassure you of His love for you. But maybe this morning you've been coming to church, You've been coming for years, but you've never really experienced the new birth. You've never come to a place where you've been broken by your own sin. You've made some improvement over time, and maybe there were some bad things you did, and now you're doing better, but you've never really run to Jesus Christ in faith. You may not have a better opportunity than you have this morning. And maybe God is calling you this morning to put an end to your rebellion and to your self-salvation projects and all of those things that you may be inclined to trust in. And He's calling you to trust in Him and offering before you the beauty and the benefit of new life in Christ. If that's so, if that's the case, may God bring you to Himself this morning. May He open your eyes to His beauty. Let's pray.